this Okay, I will have a, a quiz to get us started. <laughs> they told me you guys were all high IQ. <laughs> we shall see. Okay. Okay, there we are. The question of the day. Question. And listen carefully. How many squares do you see? Now, before you hastily make a conclusion, the question is not how many squares are there. That is not the question. The question is how many squares do you see? Okay, let's take some personal responsibility. <laughs> All righty. Okay, now that you have a number firmly in hand, I'm gonna I'll cut it off here because this is a really simple question. So you have your number? All righty. Now, where did that number come from? Yes. The exact word for this test. This is a simple exercise in perception, folks. <laughs> because, and it's, and it's illustrating the fact that you can only do that because you know something about the concept square. Somewhere in your life, you picked up this notion that there's such a thing as square. Obviously, you misapplied it here, uh, given that some of those things are not square. But you, you, you just made that assumption, right? And that's all right. Some assumptions are okay. In fact, we have to assume that this floor will hold us up and we won't sink through. So yeah, some assumptions make sense. A lot don't. A lot don't. But the reason we do the test is because there are some people around who feel that there is such a thing as the truth. But we've just proved, based on your various numbers, that that is not so because you all have different ideas about how many squares you see. So, Nicole, how many did you see? 22. 22, see, and she's proud of it. You get that sense of pride in her voice? Okay. Alrighty, Brianna. Uh, Brenna. Brenna. How many squares do I see? You still working on it? You've been influenced I, by Nicole? I mean, I was counting and I got the See, she's giving me all this explanation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then what did you wind up with? I ended up with around 25. Around 25. See, she's wavering here and there. And it's okay, because that too is very typical of us as human beings. A lot of us don't like to just zip in and make a statement. We want to hover around the edges until we get a sense that what we're doing is the right thing. By the way, there's anywhere from zero to an infinite number to be seen. Just depending on who you are. That's all. It has nothing to do with this. It all has to do with you. So what you see is the function of who you are. Now, why do we start a discussion like this with that? Because what happens in here today will be a function of your perception, how you hear what I have to say, how you see who I am and what I bring, how you see yourself. So what does that have to do with Little Rock? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> yeah. Because some of you already have notions about what happened at Little Rock. That's your 16 square notion. Why do I say 16 square? Because a large number of people see themselves in that camp of 16 square. That's a safe position to take. If you would just take a cursory glance at this thing, you could, you know, if you were forced to, say, yeah, I can see 16. And some of you who are 16 square would be going, yeah, that's my number. But others of you who are at the infinity range, whoa, you know, you begin to wonder. Well, in any case, we will start uh, at the beginning, and that is the beginning of me and Little Rock, and that all happened December 1941, my start in life. I didn't know anything about this at that point, but I quickly found out how important it was. I needed to understand what I was seeing, because initially I didn't understand anything about what I was seeing in Little Rock. Here we are, a society divided up by racial group membership, by law and by custom. Plessy decision, 1896, which by the way didn't start the madness, no. Plessy was simply a codification of stuff that had happened already. But it was necessary for the Supreme Court to make that lasting imprint on our brains because there were too many upstarts challenging the status quo. <laughs> oh yeah. Lawsuits, raised hands in classroom, could you please explain the rationale for manifest destiny? You know, can you imagine what the fourth grade teacher would do to a fourth grade student after she slapped him down? No, we don't question the wisdom of the ages. <laughs> By the way, 
some of you will be teaching in schools where manifest destiny is taught, by all means refuse to participate. At any rate, so there I am, Terry Roberts, trying to figure this stuff out. I must say I'm thoroughly confused because the Plessy decision makes absolutely no sense. Who on earth put together such a thing? But what I didn't know at the time was all of the history that led up to that. So I was operating in this present bubble. I learned later on what was really going on. But in 1954, something rather magical happened, and that is the same Supreme Court that had ruled in Plessy now ruled in Brown, okay? Years later, years later, the Brown Court says, and get this, the language is very important, it is no longer constitutional to discriminate. No longer constitutional. Wow, that got my attention. Really? No longer? Well, then the inference, of course, is it had happened prior to how many years prior to? And then my research took me all the way back to the year 1619. 1619. Arbitrary. But that's okay, because we have the right to start our timeline wherever we want. So we started 1619. We pull it forward to 1954. Now, audience participation. How many years between 1619 and 1954? We will pause until an answer is yelled out. Your mutterings. <laughs> Eventually, there will be a number. 334, she says. She almost got it right. 335. It's an odd number, you know. You subtract the nine from the four. <laughs> I know that part of it. <laughs> okay, but well, thank you. You got us on the right track. So 335 years. Now, I want you to hold that number in your hand to feel the weight of it because that's the time period from 1619 to 1954, the 335 year time period, wherein in this country it was legal, constitutional, morally acceptable to discriminate against people based on racial group membership by law and by custom for 335 years. Now some of you haven't thought about it in quite that way. Some of you, especially if you're more recent arrivals in the universe, and I can tell by looking at your faces, some of you are indeed very new. <laughs> you have not challenged the status quo very much in your lifetime, but essentially, if you're going to be the very best teacher you can be, you will, because that will be essentially your job. Shaking the pillars of truth as they are presented to you to understand for yourself whether or not they make sense. Not take them simply at face value because someone else in authority tells you. <laughs> not even Terry Roberts. By the way, what I'm saying to you has to do with who I am. In fact, whenever any human being is saying anything, that person is telling you who they happen to be in the moment. That's all. It has nothing to do with challenging you. See, a lot of kids on the street haven't figured that out. I've heard kids say, what you looking at? <laughs> As a prelude to a fight. But in any case, in 1954, as a 13-year-old, I was really excited because of the shift in the Supreme Court attitude and opinion. By the way, some of you may have already decided to be part of that crowd called the strict constructionists of the Constitution. And the premise for that group is this document is inviolate and it never changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, why did it say one thing in 1896 and something else in 1954? Something tells me they're not quite right. I don't know how many squares they're seeing. Anyway, now that I'm enthused about this shift, because why? The law is on my side. I am motivated to do something. And that initial motivation is to model law-abiding behavior. Yes, I'm going to take the 54 decision and I'm going to model for the populace. This is how it works, folk. <laughs> you take advantage of learning opportunities as they exist in your neighborhood. Central was my neighborhood school. An easy decision for me. So by the time the school board caught up with my thinking, we put a plan in place, I was already volunteered. I had volunteered myself in 1954. So here I am now in 1957, able to raise both hands and throw the count off by one, that yes, we volunteer, and there were about 150 of us, by the way. We weren't always just the Little Rock Nine. Initially, we were Little Rock 150 originally, and that makes a lot of difference. That's like a small fighting unit. As it was, though, we were reduced to just a patrol group <laughs> of nine, and uh, we adopted nonviolence as a consequence. If you try and take on the powers that be with just a small group, you're in trouble. So we knew that. 
made more sense to go in nonviolent, and maybe we would die a martyr's death. And that would be, you know, uh, I don't know, something to build upon. Not that I wish that upon ourselves. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't happen. And the only reason it didn't happen was we wound up with the army to protect us. By the way, without the army, uh, yeah, they would have taken us out. Oh, no question. They told us every day they were going to do it. But the army was sort of a buffer. At any rate, first day of school, there were 10 of us. We were the Little Rock 10 on day one. Some of you didn't know that either. But as you watched that movie, you actually saw Little Rock 10 uh, and didn't know it. Jane Hill was among the group on day one. Her dad received a telephone call from his employer with a very terse message, if you send Jane back, don't bother coming to work anymore. While that threat was enough to have him pull her out, he lost his job anyway, which is something I could have told him had he bothered to call me. <laughs> I knew as a 15-year-old, Based on the situation and what I already knew about life in the U.S., his job was history. The immediate point happened when the boss found out that he had the temerity to think he could send Jane to Central High School. In his mind, institution only for white kids. That was the boss's perspective. And so there we are, nine kids at the mercy of the elements and the opponents. You know, the one thing that really stands out for me even today is in the mob there were these grandparents holding their grandkids' hands, showing them this is how it's done, kids. This is America at its finest. We protest against this madness of having black kids in the school. And I didn't know what to do because I have some empathy for kids because they're like sponges and they just soak up whatever. And what if you baptize them in the ideology of racism at that age? Then we get Bowers. Pittsburgh, or those of his ilk. In any case, as they say in, what city are you from? San Diego. San Diego, as they say in San Diego, it was on. <laughs> yeah. Nine against the world. And we were, as I said, nonviolent. Well, I have to amend that a little bit. I was at that time and remain 99.9% .9 nonviolent. Oh yeah, I reserve 0.01% for those special occasions. <laughs> but we got into school eventually with the Army, as I say, the governor tried to keep us out. It would have been the governor's wish that we never showed up. And we had to go through the hell of that year. Now, if you can imagine any human being thinking of anything they might do to another human being, that's what they did to us, with a sense of impunity. Well, we made it through. We got through the year somehow. At the end of the year, the governor is still fuming. He's mad, he's angry, he doesn't know what to do. So he says, okay, next year it's not gonna be this way. We're not gonna have any black students in Central High School. In fact, we're not having any students at Central High or any high school in Little Rock because I'm going to close them down. And using his authority as governor, he signed an executive order to close all high schools in Little Rock. And they remain closed for a year. <laughs> I'm just chuckling here because he was at somewhat a disadvantage. He didn't have Twitter, but he could use the executive order. But they didn't get that much cachet, you know. Had he been able to use Twitter, he could have made a much bigger splash. Technology. Ha. At any rate, rather than languish in Little Rock, since I had one year of high school remaining, rather than languish in Little Rock wondering what next, I had accepted an invitation from relatives who happened to live in Los Angeles. So I left Little Rock and came to LA. I moved from one part of the South to another part of the South. By the way, for those of you who have not yet altered your mental GPS to let you know that the South is any place south of Canada, well, do that now, because you don't want to be confused. So wherever you are, San Diego, oh yeah, part of the South. Uh -huh. Not just Southern California either. <laughs> the deep South. Uh, <laughs> south of Canada. Just make that switch. And so here we are in the year 2018, still grappling with issues that have their origin as far back as 1619. Oh, yeah. Some you can trace very, trace very directly. And so we're going to spend the remainder of our time talking together, and your questions or comments will be the catalytic agents for this dialogue. So you're on the spot. I don't know who you are, person with question number one, 
but you have such a role to play because prior to your speaking there will be complete silence. <laughs> Deep South. Deep South, like yes. mentally. Mm -hmm. Mentally, mm -hmm. socially, psychologically, spatially. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> no getting around. <laughs> and, and I know that's a big piece for a lot of people to chew on because we sometimes like to live in these dream worlds where there's no such thing as anti Semitism, is there? <laughs> but the president said, he didn't seem as because his problem is, well, okay, I'm going to reform. <laughs> I'm actually going to reform. I'm not going to bring him into all discussions. <laughs> no need to do that. <laughs> yes. Okay, so number two is right here. Right. Amy the first. Yes. <laughs> uh, my question for you is, were there any teachers who made a positive difference for you at Central? Because they did show the one classmate who shared the textbook. Were there any teachers who are willing to make that risk, or were they more brainwashed? Yeah, now, in a, in a more general sense, I can tell you, historically, there have always been outliers who have provided aid, succor, and support for those who have been oppressed and discriminated against. So with that backdrop, obviously at Central, we did too. Not a lot, as you might well imagine. Not a lot. In fact, you could think of teachers, students, administrators, all living along a continuum from one extreme to the other. Now at this end, they hated us with vile passion, all of them. But at this end, at another extreme, there were those who thought, well, maybe they should have a chance. Do you see? But there was a clustering on this end, unfortunately. And so there were only a few. Robin stood out as a, a totally an outlier. But again, your review of history will show you, more often than not, it's just a few people who will take a stand. Because I couldn't imagine a history teacher, for example, being one to still be so backwards mm -hmm. in regards well, to Well, you haven't been to Little Rock. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like your perception of the true history teacher would not include such a thing. But yeah, think of continuum. You got some history teachers over there hanging out on the, on the extreme right. <laughs> My English teacher, I have to tell you about her. A piece of work. <laughs> now, this woman, I don't know how she managed it, but she could twist her face to give the unmistakable message that she hated me. I would replicate that for you here today if I could, but I don't have that ability to twist my face as she did. But suffice it to say, I got the message. When I walked in, okay, I understood. She would prefer my not being there in the mildest sense. <laughs> so I assumed at that point that I would obviously receive an F on my report card. And that's good, you know, you have advance notice of these things. <laughs> but, at the end, guess what? I got an A. Blew me away. I tell you, I went home, I told my friend about it. His initial response was to laugh hysterically. I could not communicate with him because he's rolling on the floor. LMAO. <laughs> so, I said, once he was able to speak, he said, don't you get it, kid? That woman never wants to see you again in her classroom, ever. So that A is just a pass out. I thought about it. Then I said, no, there's got to be an alternative explanation. And then it quickly came to me. I had an epiphany. She couldn't deny genius in her presence. <laughs> oh, yeah. That made a lot more sense. But, yeah, the teachers were also, and the students, were under orders from the powers that be. If you befriend the black students, we will kill you too. Now, that's a lot of weight to put on people, especially if they don't have much courage in the, in the beginning. But a few people did, and that's the message for you. No matter what, you can be among the few if you choose. Now, a lot of you are like rabbits. You are so frightened, you're not going to do anything. I know this. That's all right. Don't feel badly about your rabbithood. <laughs> There's hope for you if you so desire. You can learn how to be a tiger. <laughs> yeah, or an elephant. The elephant is a real king of the jungle, by the way. Lion, no, pretenders. <laughs> so when the elephants walk, the lions respectfully move away. <laughs> yeah, all of that animal metaphor just to let you know what you can do.
I'm, I have to confess, uh, and this is really good, to your question is a very good question, but your use of the word they reminds me of that pronoun thing back on the table. Okay. I'm wondering, is she talking about an individual or a group? <laughs> that aside, that's my issue. Denying but students that volunteer to go to the first year, did they go back after they opened, or? Some of us did. Yeah. Some of us did. Now, seven of us were actually eligible to return. One of our group had graduated. He was ineligible. One of our group had actually gotten kicked out in the year 57, 58. Read that story, that's really important. Uh, she got kicked out for fighting. So now there's seven of us who still have high school to complete, and the schools are now reopened. All five of us who had been juniors are no longer interested because we've enrolled in schools elsewhere to complete our senior year. Three of the kids had been 10th grade. Two of them actually returned in the school year 58-59. I mean, 59-60, pardon me, 59-60. So three of our group are bona fide graduates of Central High. All of us are honorary. I even have a ring. <laughs> I've got a ring. I never wear it. Um, I barely wear this one. This is a wedding ring. I didn't wear this for years. In fact, I had my wife convinced that I liked her best unadorned. <laughs> she bought it. Okay. Until her friend came and took her to take it. I saw the Oprah episode where a couple of your classmates came forward and apologized. Yes. A few, and again, not that many, as you, again, might well imagine. Over the years, a few people have shown up, but you could count them on one hand. And those, even those on Oprah's show, weren't, they weren't honest. You know, they just came for the Oprah, <laughs> the, what do you call that when you come on Oprah? <laughs> you get the experience, right? You also get a mug. You get one mug. <laughs> they won't let you have two. <laughs> Which is, it led me into thievery because I couldn't go home with just one mug. <laughs> um, I just wondered how long after your, after the first nine of you were there, did other African American students start enrolling in the school? Oh, the very next year when they opened, opened the schools. Uh, as I was saying, two of our original group came back in that crowd, and I think there were five of them. There were the Little Rock Five that year. And then eventually, at one point, the school became just about 99% black and brown because of white flight. You know, white people just pulled stakes and choo, boom, got a move. And then they gradually gentrified back. So now, the school, by the way, it's a national park, and I think there are about 37 different languages spoken in that school, and it's touted as being a success. <laughs> yeah, but that's all for show. The truth is, they're still dealing with the issues from 335 years ago, as we all are. But they are more so because they've been really committed to maintaining the status quo. Yes? Uh, so what was your sort of motivation or drive to continue your education? Because clearly you had a negative experience to say experience. Well, experiences are neither negative nor positive. But what is important is how you respond to the situation. I always thought, as soon as I was able to think about things, that something was off here in Little Rock. Didn't make any sense. I was a person of reason, and I tried to find some reasonable explanation for segregation, discrimination, it never came, it made no sense. So I was always resisting and pushing. So my thought was I needed to figure out some strategies. Being educated made more sense than anything, because I needed to know. You really have a need to know. And by the way, some of you are aspiring teachers, right? Your all needs, of all, of, all of you guys are, okay, well, your need to know is, wow, so big. You know why? Because the largest thing you own is a storehouse of ignorance. You don't know very much. I don't either. But sometimes what makes a real difference is knowing that you have this storehouse of ignorance. Once you know it, then you are not surprised by it at odd moments because you thought you knew everything. <laughs> then a student pops up and bops your bubble right there. But know in advance that your task is to learn as much as you can, as fast as you can, about what? Mainly about you. Yeah. Your first lesson is who am I and what am I all about? You, why? Because as teacher, and by the way, that's not the, the real name for your profession. 
uh, because that implies that you know something, you know. So you have to think about that too. I suggest that you think of yourself as a learner and you're going to model learning in the classroom. But what you want to do is to know that your job is sacred. You've been entrusted with the care and feeding of these young minds. And who you are is going to make a difference because as soon as you walk in the classroom, they're going to read your story. It's going to be on your face, in your mannerisms, how you react to stuff like this. See, each child, you will have to decide how many squares do I see. This happens with each child. And some kids are going to be at, I don't know, some extreme end of your continuum. <laughs> but if you know in advance, you can do something about it, you see. Some kids you won't like. Others you will simply adore. Ah, oh, yes. But the thing is, keep in mind that every single child in that classroom deserves the best of you all the time you are there. And if that is your commitment, then by all means go for it. If not, then perhaps you need to rethink your choice. Yeah, you gotta rethink that choice. Okay, so, yes. How did you peacefully deal with bullies that plagued you in the school? Oh, I love the way ACC phrased the question. How did I peacefully deal with bullies? Sometimes I dealt with them peacefully. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, it, just because the human beings and their choice of how to be in the universe refuse to learn the language of nonviolence. But they spend a lot of time learning the language of violence. That's why I, I reserve 0.01% so that I can speak to everybody. <laughs> so, bullies to me, Early on, I could see what was going on. I was picked on from the time I was in first grade on through. Why? Because I represented for a lot of kids the, the antithesis of what they thought. They thought going to school was a real burden and they had no business being there, didn't want to be there. They didn't like people who were there. They especially didn't like me because I loved being there. Okay? <laughs> so I took it on the chin, so to speak, because I was a real student. I wanted to learn. And I got beaten up a lot for it, but I figured out that it had nothing to do with me, really. Bullying had nothing to do with me. It was about the other people and their needs and so forth. And they seemed to be really off a bit, you know? So I learned how to communicate with them, okay? And I could see stuff shaping up, and I would speak words so that I could alleviate the situation and go on about my business. So that's learning about yourself. So when somebody started, see the prelude for a fight was often the dialogue. And a lot of it was started with the words, yo mama, okay? <laughs> now for a lot of people, just to say those two words gets them into an agitated state. Your mama, well, what, what about my mama, right? No, 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 that's not the attitude. Because remember, what that person is saying, what is the message? What did I say a few minutes ago? When any person is talking? Were you guys really listening? They're talking, They're talking about themselves, okay? These people, whatever, I'm talking here today, all I'm saying is, this is who I am. I'm Terry Roberts. And if you listen carefully, you can find out who I am. <laughs> you won't have to guess. Because over time, if you listen carefully, I will tell you the truth about myself. Well, at any rate, that was diffused. So if somebody came to me with your mama, I would perk up. I wanted, do you really have some pertinent information about my mother? More often than not, no. <laughs> then I would seek to enlighten them. Oh, you are mistaken. <laughs> you can, I'll come home with me this, this afternoon. I will open the closet. You can check for yourself. I don't think she even owns a pair of combat boots, okay? Well, then they would go and hassle somebody else. <laughs> During those times when they wouldn't leave me alone, that's when I had to exercise the 0.1%. Now, there was this kid in middle school who loved to thump my head. Every time he saw me, he would thump my head. I appealed to him on the basis of Humanity. I said, that hurts. It's inconvenient. I don't like it. Would you please stop? He slapped and thumped my head. So, okay, I thought, okay, I've got to go to plan B. So, plan B was to avoid. I changed my time of arrival at school. I changed my door of entry. I changed as much as I could. He, however, was very resourceful. He found me and bingo. So then, I had to go to another plan. So I said, look, I caught him in the hall one day. I stopped him and I spoke and I was very careful about my approach here because I didn't want him to miss the message. I spoke clearly, distinctly, and slowly, and I used gestures. I said, if you thump my head one more time, I will hurt you. 
See, this is a very straightforward message. And I thought, he seemed to get it. I thought, wow, I'm so glad, I'm relieved, <laughs> it's over. Except it wasn't. So next time he saw me, he thumped my head. Now, the aftermath, which is not pretty, <laughs> is he wound up in the emergency room. I have no conscious recollection of what I actually did to that kid, but <laughs> I do know that I felt justified because he had been forewarned. And I told him in very exact detail that I would hurt him. I don't know why he disregarded that message. I have no clue. What was, what was, was his brain missed? I don't know. It may have been after that. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not proud of that, putting him in the emergency room. But you know, one thing I learned about myself during that episode, it wasn't just about him, it was about my fear of getting hurt by others. It was deeply hidden from me. But at that moment, it came to the fore because I was a shaken wreck because you know that kid was really hurt. And I thought, I didn't intend to do that, but it was a good learning about myself. I learned I have the capacity to kill. So I had to monitor that. So over time, I've learned how to be a really decent human being. I choose not to kill anybody. So you're all safe. I'm not going to kill you. Uh, but I have that capacity. See, I know this. You need to know what you're capable of, too. If you walk around, quote, in the dark, and you don't even know what you're capable of, you could do anything, given the right provocation. But if you know in advance, you know, what's going to happen when you're up against an unruly kid, <laughs> and that kid challenges you, OK? Are you going to resort to the id? and just go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a six-year-old? <laughs> you don't have to if you know in advance that what that kid is doing, one, has nothing to do with you, two, what that kid thinks about you is none of your business, <laughs> and that's really true. Anybody, what anybody thinks about you is none of your business. You don't have time for that. They will think about you, by the way. <laughs> they will have all kinds of untoward thoughts about you, but none of that has anything to do with you. You cannot program everybody's brain to see you as a wonderful person you are. <laughs> yeah, not everybody's gonna buy into that. But you can know in advance how wonderful you are and how wonderful you can be and how you can model wonderfulness in the universe. You can do that if you choose. Now, it's up to you. By the way, that's all you can do as human beings. You can choose. You can't do anything else, <laughs> right? You're going to say you can? No. Are you holding up your hand? No. And saying, I can choose. I, I can choose. I can yeah. um, I just have a question. Okay. Um, as your school year went on, and you spend time with your classmates just by nature being in the room with them, did your classmates ever, um, or were they ever more kind to you, or did they leave you alone? You mean the kids at Central? Mm -hmm. That is such an optimistic question. I love it, though. <laughs> because it speaks to what human beings might possibly do. Right. They did. Now, this crowd, they were pretty much involved in maintaining the status quo. In fact, a number of kids in my classes got up and walked out on day one. They never came back. They were the most intransigent. Others stayed, but they weren't happy about it. See? Not knowing enough about themselves. They felt trapped in a room with somebody they didn't like. And they would have taken it out on me. And they did. And it was hellish. And over the years, not too much changed. I think a lot of kids were simply mute participants. They could see what was going on. Some of them didn't like it. Some of them appreciated it. They didn't condone it. But they were not eager to step up and say no. In fact, I ran into one such person years later. Chronologically, it had been about 40 years since the episode in Little Rock. We were in the Little Rock Airport. He recognized me. He says, hey, you're Terry Roberts. I acknowledge, yes, I am. He said, I was in your PE class at which time I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> because even after 40 years, but I think, you know, maybe this guy wants to continue the attack. But he said, no, no, he waved that off. I wasn't one of the ones beating you up. I was one of the ones watching you get beaten up. That's how he positioned himself. Well, I empathize with him. I said, you know what, had I been in your shoes, I may have been just watching too, I don't know. But in any case, I didn't condemn him. He then confessed to me that he had a very large psychological lump that had been sitting there in his chest for 40 years. And at the end of our conversation, he could feel it lightening a little bit. I thought, wow, okay. Then I chided him humorously. I said, you know, had you jumped in and gotten your head beat with me, you wouldn't have had to have that. <laughs> A lot of people don't understand the efficacy of you know, getting beaten in the moment, 
so you can feel better in the long run. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense, right? That's nonviolence for you, by the way. Nonviolence means you will suffer the blows, but your vision is larger than a single fight. That you will be around to preach a new and better gospel later, yes. Did you continue that nonviolence policy throughout the civil rights movement, or did that change as you as it continued as well? You know, that's a very interesting question because I consider myself to have been inducted into the Civil Rights Army in December 3rd, 1941, and I've been an active soldier since. And I think my duties are still required. <laughs> so I'm still on duty as a civil rights activist. Yes. So I wrote a book report on World you War did. in elementary Whoa. school. And it is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to be a teacher, because okay. I remember feeling so confused how schools could feel so unsafe. And now in classrooms, students are still feeling unsafe because of discrimination they're facing. So I'm curious if you have suggestions or approaches we can take as teachers to limit that feeling of exclusion and discrimination in our classrooms. That's such a great question. And it boils down to your willingness to offer that safety to each student in your care through relationship. See, that vehicle of relationship is so vital. Let's say you're gonna enter classrooms that are probably gonna be much larger than necessary. Uh, if you're going to be in public schools. But your job is still to build these individual relationships with each student. Not every student is the same, just to say something that is so obviously true. And so your task is really big. Yeah. But think about doing that and ways you can do that. When you walk in, by the way, all those students are going to have a picture of who you are in their heads. Keep in mind that it has nothing to do with who you really are. So give them a chance to alter that picture from you. And it means being open to the individual personality standing or sitting there before you. Something I, I found about teachers as first grader, my first grade teacher, wonderful teacher, she told us six-year-olds she said to us, you kids must take on executive responsibility for learning. You have to become CEO of your own independent learning enterprise. And I thought, wow, magic. I don't know if the teacher truly understood what kind of fire she had ignited in all of us, but for me, it was a raging inferno. Wow. So right there in September of 1947, I established the Terry Robertson Learning Academy. And that academy has been full-blown, Dues paid on time every year. <laughs> no late fees, no penalties. Why? Because that's important. See, with a storehouse of ignorance, what's the antidote? Learning. Yeah, obviously. And since we don't know much every day, and by the way, your learning agenda doesn't go down. It grows. Why? Because of the advance of knowledge. You, you remember, well, maybe some of you have yet to even know this man's name, Alvin Toffler, <laughs> in the 60s. He wrote a book called Future Shock. And one of the big things about that book was he divided all of human existence into 20-year lifetimes. And then he said it was only in the last few lifetimes that we had uncovered the most knowledge. And that is exponentially exploding even now, years later. So more knowledge, more knowledge. Now Google's trying to help. They're trying to catalog everything. So you'll have it there, which is good because your quest demands that you have access. But keep in mind that it's your job. You can be the executive in charge. And when you go into a classroom, it's not about figuring out what you're going to teach the students, but how you're going to model learning for them, how you're going to accomplish that. See, now, if you take a position that you already know everything, they're going to sniff you out so fast and write you off so quickly. Kids know this stuff intuitively. And they're all eager to learn, by the way. You may not think it based on the face they present to you, but you've got to read through that. You can't be thrown off by the face you're presented with. Who knows what's behind that face? But uh, take it seriously and go for it. Now, life itself is interesting because you think of it as a drama. And when you come on board, what year did you enter the universe? 1996. Okay, so from 1996, you see, you've got all this stuff that happened before 1996 that you need to know. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. Whenever you drop in, see, we all dropped into the drama. 
Life's been going on for years, centuries before we arrive, and yet here we are on stage, now new actor, somebody gives you a name, somebody calls you Monique, whether it's your name or not, you don't have to answer, it's all rhetorical. It may be Monique is your name, maybe not, but you're saddled with it. <laughs> and that's something you might do in terms of research about names. Where do these names come from? Because names have a lot of meaning. At any rate, your mission above anything else is to learn who you are, especially you in relation to these others in the universe. And who are these others? Anybody except you. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I'd like for you also to dispossess yourself of this notion that you have a built-in tribe, especially in terms of racial group membership. Some of you may have thought that you are a member of a certain racial group. That's all bogus because there's no such animal as race. That myth hopefully has been destroyed in the minds of the thinking person and we're working on those whose minds are limited. Uh, but in any case, no scientific or biological support for the notion, none whatsoever. Now, if you're wondering about difference, then by all means, wonder about it, but know that it exists because of ancestry, <laughs> okay? That crowd, that great crowd of people in your ancestry line, and how many are there? Millions of them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you come from a line of millions. You have no idea who they are. And by the way, don't waste your money with 23andMe and Ancestry.com, because that's just a waste of money. In fact, if you want to know that stuff, send your money to me, I'll make it up for you. <laughs> But your ancestors existing by the millions, copulating furiously over centuries, and then all of a sudden, bingo, there you are. Not about race, folks, it's about proximity. Whoever's in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, a lot of people don't like that because they, they want to say, oh, no, no, I come from a long line of certain, certain, You may or you may not. You never know. You know who's to account for that? When you say we, the U.S., the United oh, okay. States. Yeah. Are you surprised where we're at, or what? Do, what no, do you no, no. Like when you read the history of this country, yeah. there's no way on earth you can be surprised by what's happening today, mm -hmm. because you could have predicted it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Just read, and it's all there. By the way, it's written down. Absolutely written down. We, the people, have so dedicated ourselves to maintain the ideology of racism that will give you a clue about what's going to happen to us this year, next year, and so forth. We're into it, deeply embedded. It's bone marrow level. That's where we live. Think about it. Over 99% of us choose what some people call monoracial, monocultural lives, in terms of who you associate with, where you live, where you go to school, all that stuff. 99% of us do that. My wife and I happen to live in Pasadena. And we live in a block, in a neighborhood, really, where people tell us, oh, you live in an all-white neighborhood. This is what they tell us. And then I'm puzzled. I'm looking around, and I stand up as tall as I can and say, yeah, but I live there. <laughs> How can it be all-white? They forget that part, OK? It's so embedded in their head about the use of space that the space we occupy, generally, they say, they may not admit it, but what they're saying is, you're not supposed to be there. That's a space for white people. Exactly, right? Truth is, it's an all-black neighborhood with a lot of white people. <laughs> <laughs> Perspective. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, obviously, they had to have done so because as infants, we have no defense <laughs> against those who are dis dis designated as our caretakers, right? So yeah, my parents and uh, older sibling, there was one. I was the second occupant of a, turned out to, to be a well-used womb. There are seven of us kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> being number two is really cool, because you know, reasonably good condition. <laughs> But then the ideas and notions that they have sort of get pushed into you. So we had to deal with that. So part of your task in life, by the way, is spending off some of the crazy stuff that your parents told you. <laughs> yeah, and not giving into that thing about respecting parents by holding on to outmoded ideas. No, no, no. You represent an important phase of life because every individual counts. Every single individual counts. By the way, I have a reading, a book 
I was going to say reading list, but I don't want to burden you. But I do have a one book <laughs> that I just read. I just read this book about five days ago. It's called The End of Average. And you've got to be teachers. You need this book. You need this book. The End of Average by Todd Rose. Todd is a professor at Harvard. He has a PhD. But that does not tell the whole story because he's a high school dropout. He dropped out of high school with a 0.9 grade point average. Now you say to yourself, how did he get to Harvard? <laughs> it's all about, it's all in this book. He explains it all. The end of average. So important. Because every student you have in your classroom will count, just like you count. The world is not complete on any given day until every one of us make our contribution. It's that serious. For those of you who are just coasting through life, ah, la la la, wake up. <laughs> it's time for you to grab onto the reins and direct your course. And you can't do that with ignorance. You've got to know stuff, really know it. But also, understand that there will be times and places when you will not know because you have not yet studied it. Don't count that against you, okay? A lot of people give up when they're in situations. My, my second daughter, Becky, came home. She was in an algebra class for the first time in her life. She'd never been in an algebra class. And she came home crying. I said, Becky, why are you crying? She said, I failed the algebra test. I said, no surprise, you're ignorant. <laughs> she didn't like to hear that, but that was the truth. <laughs> I said, if you knew algebra, you would have aged the test, right? Well, I said, the thing is, you gotta learn algebra, kid. <laughs> so I helped her with what I knew. I knew a little algebra, not that much, but that was enough. That was sort of a catalyst for her. She got on board because I also preached to her that she had to be the executive in charge of her learning. You know, it didn't happen overnight, but they got it. Both my daughters finally got it. And they have excelled in terms of being learners. Now they call me up with a reading list. Dad, you got to read this. <laughs> They're off and running. They also are very critical of the movies we watch. Don't go see that. Okay. And it's good. It saved us money. I trust their judgment. I trust a lot of my kids. In fact, my kids, my two daughters, are the only people on earth who, if they are the driver of the car, I can actually sleep in the car. The only two, no one else. Why? Because I know those kids. <laughs> and I know I taught them to drive. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So you said after Central closed, you went to Los Angeles and you were enrolled in school? Oh, yeah. No, no, LA is where I went. Oh. <laughs> no, no. So, how was your experience there compared to? Well, I was prepared for it because I knew that I was coming west, but still in the south. So I understood I was going to have to deal with how racism was manifested in LA. And that, you know, that's a good way to come in because then you're not surprised or shocked. I, I, I had a, a kid at, at UCLA, young black male come into my office one day and he was really upset, visibly upset, shaken. And he says, Dr. Roberts, I've got a real problem. I, oh, okay, so I closed the door, I you know, told him to take a few deep breaths, you know. Then I said, okay, now what's your problem? Then he told me he had a racist professor. So I'm waiting to hear, and he looked at me and he raised his voice, he said it again. I have a racist professor. Yeah, 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 I heard that. But I'm waiting to hear your problem. He said, well, that's my problem. And I stood back in a gas. I said, are you kidding me? Young man, that's not your problem. That's your reality. <laughs> okay. Who failed to tell you that there would be more than one racist professor at this institution? Who failed to give you that vital information? That's why it's so important to know, you see. UCLA, like any other institution, has been baptized in the ideology of racism. How else would there, how could there not be racist professors? That just makes sense if you know where you live, south of Canada. <laughs> I may have to like, change that once I go to Canada and stay a while. We'll see. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> Whatever you do will create opportunities for others to say no to your reality 
and try to superimpose upon you their reality. What are you trying to do? Make us look bad? You think you're smarter than we are now because you're out there with those white kids? You know, that sort of stuff. Or as my next door neighbor said, she lost her job. See? She said, it's your fault. I'm unemployed because of you. Why are you creating all these problems? What do you say to your neighbor? Because the truth is, the retaliation was that a lot of black people lost jobs. Whether they had kids in school, whether they had kids or not, it didn't matter. They were black, and so they had to pay the price. That's how things work in, in the U.S. And if you read the history book, you'll see that's how things work, okay? That's how stuff happens. Yes? What did your parents think of it? Were they supportive? Or what did they think of it being? Of you attending Central. Ah, okay. They were 100% supportive. Mm -hmm. We will support your decision 100%. That was actually my question. You were telepathic stuff. And at any, at any point, did your parents like, want you to pull out, or were they just behind you the whole time? Did you say, did they like want me to pull out, or did they really want me to pull out? Did they, did they oh, want okay. you to pull out at any point in time, or were they just 100% supportive the entire time? 100% supportive the whole time. Now, I must confess, folk, you sometimes throw me off with the overuse of the word like. I have <laughs> no clue why that ever happened. <laughs> Cannot beg heads or tails of it. I mean, we seem to be a, a sane group, and yet, okay. <laughs> okay, there was another hand up. Now, I hope it's not because you can't get to use the word like that you can keep it there. <laughs> I will suffer. <laughs> By the way, if you think that's bad, I'm also going to ban the use of guttural utterances before. You see, often before people will speak, they'll take time to say, oh. Or during the speech, we'll pepper it with numerous ahs. I've never found that helpful. Never found that helpful. Or useful. Or sign of intelligence. <laughs> Just throw that last thing. <laughs> All right. My younger siblings actually all went to school here in L.A. Oh, okay. My youngest sister had been born in February of 1957. Mm -hmm. So her worldview of Little Rock is nil. She grew up here. Mm -hmm. The others were, the other three of them, there were four of them, we call them little kids. Mm -hmm. See, a family of seven. We had the first three. For a long time, we kids, as a group of three, thought that we were a family of five. Mm -hmm. And we were joyously happy about that. And then all of a sudden we get four surprises <laughs> in a row. Bing, bing. Uh, late in the game, too. So they were, they were little kids and they came out here. They did elementary school and high school and then eventually college right here. Mm -hmm. But their worldview is somewhat different altogether because they did not have the Little Rock experience over much. A little bit for some of them. But for Lisa, not much at all. So when they left there, she was still shy of being a year old. She was born in Uno, and she was there a year because she was there the whole of 57, and they moved in December 58, so a year and a half. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's her life in Little Rock, one year and one half. She was probably crawling. I don't know. By the way, when you read Todd Rose, it doesn't matter if you ever crawl. <laughs> Individuals, they, do, they walk when they want to. So if you're going to be parents later and you're thinking about this, just before advance notice. <laughs> Your kid's not being the norm, don't worry about it. The norm doesn't work. <laughs> Your kid is the norm. Yeah, think about it that way. Yes? Can you speak a little bit about the like lasting impacts that this experience has had on you? Like the experience of being surrounded by hate and how that kind of changes a person in your well, you know, it can change a person if that person chooses to be changed by it. There is no assumption that works in that regard. In fact, I had a young reporter, UCLA Daily Bruin. I agreed to an interview with her about what happened in Little Rock and all the hateful stuff that was going on. And finally, she asked me a very direct question. She said, what do you do with your hatred toward white people? And she seemed serious, so I gave her serious consideration. But then after thinking about it, I said to her, honestly, well, I don't have any hatred to a white people. She laughed. She said, oh, come on, come on. You, you can tell me, <laughs> okay? And I, again, had to reiterate, no, I have no hatred. At which point, she became angry. <laughs> she developed 
a real attitude. And she slammed her notebook closed and she said, well, if you're gonna lie to me, we can't do the interview. And she left, sure, you're gone. Never wrote the story. Now that's problematic from my perspective because she, as a journalist, one would think she would have a very open mind, right? <laughs> Maybe she wound up working on Fox. <laughs> but the thing is, I have never developed a hatred towards anybody. And I, I count that, you know, now that I understand that most people don't, I count it really important and useful for me as a younger person. I see, I learned this very early. My mom, I don't know where she got this wisdom, but this woman knew a lot. She told all seven of us kids, she said, look, this is how life is in the U.S. She painted a picture that was totally realistic. No holes barred sort of thing. So we understood what we were up against as black kids. She said, now, your experiences are gonna be such that you might be tempted to react with hatred or anger or upset. You can do that, that's your choice. However, if you choose that, keep in mind that that requires a lot of expenditure of your life energy. And the other person or persons whom you choose to hate will offer nothing they won't pay, you have to pay for them. <laughs> you have to pay double. And I thought, well, mathematically, that makes no sense at all. So I opted not to do that. I opted to love people, which is what you can choose. And you can do that. You know what I was saying before? You can only choose. You can verify that by the fact that none of you can create anything. None of you can just stand up in here and say, let there be whatever. No, you can't do that. And you can't even destroy stuff. You might take this styrofoam cup and use some form of ignition to reduce it from solid to ashes and gas. Yes, you could participate in that exchange, but you cannot destroy the elements. So if you can't create and if you can't destroy, what are you left with? You have to choose from among the available existing options. Again, a real support for the power of learning because if you learn, you know more options. Yeah. I am a member of the Word of the Day Club. You didn't know about that, right? Mm -hmm. Merriam-Webster. You can sign up, it's free. You get a new word every day. Your vocabulary increases at least by one every day, <laughs> okay? What happens when your vocabulary increases? You have more choices, because you know what people are talking about. I saw a snippet of a movie just the other day. Goldie Hawn was the actress. And some guy was coming to her because she had been tapped to be the protocol officer. And she goes, wow, protocol, that is so cool. She said, wait just a minute, she went tearing into the house, got the dictionary, da, 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 looking up protocol. <laughs> what would have been the case had she known in advance what it was, you see? Save energy, save maybe embarrassment, I don't know. I learned at an early age how important words were. So I'm at this dance, and then there's Yvonne, who is, whoa, I mean, totally outstanding. And I'm interested. And she's coy, and she comes by and whispers very close. And she says, do you believe in interdigitation? And then she's gone, zoop. Now, I never heard the word. I, oh, I'm flustered. What does she mean? Is it a whole other So I went racing around trying to find a dictionary, <laughs> like Goldie Hawn. And I found out what it was. It's about interdigitation, holding hands, uh, perhaps. But it threw me for a loop, because my imagination went wild. <laughs> <laughs> so, power of words. If you know, mentor said to me once, if you know the names of the words that will move people to action, you have power. Now, I'm not interested in having power, but I am interested in how words are important, how you use them, how you say them. That's why I get strangely upset when people overuse the word like, because I'm thinking that's not fair to the word like. See, the word like needs to be in context. All words live for being in proper context. And then here you come, my neighbor once, who was a man who lived in England most of his life, was so upset with Americans because they use swear words. He said they use them almost as if they're punctuation because it has no business being in a sentence. I agreed with him, totally. But a lot of us have lost that relationship with words to the degree that we just throw them around willy-nilly as if they don't matter at all. 
One of the current things I'm having trouble with, as I mentioned earlier, is that whole business of the pronouns, of how all of you guys are open to choose whatever pronoun you want. And maybe that's the way the world is going to go. I don't know. Um, so I can, I can anticipate issues for me because I'm going to misinterpret a lot of stuff. Because if you say they, I'm thinking group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. All righty. It's all about taking in and dealing with it. So how am I going to deal with that? I don't know. Honestly. My wife says, shape up, kid. It's the new age. <laughs> She's always saying something like that. Um, did, you, did you see in touch the, the other age of the Little Rock Nine? Have you guys kind of Yes, yes, yes. The group of nine of us, by the way, only eight of us remain, and yet we still retain that moniker of the Little Rock Nine. We have a foundation, and I would like to invite you to consider the next time you're in front of a screen, which won't be too long, you already did. <laughs> uh, look up the Little Rock Nine Foundation. LR9Foundation.org preceded by the requisite www. Nobody ever writes anyone. Anyway. But uh, once you're there, you'll find out a number of opportunities. One will be labeled contribution. That's the one you want to focus on. <laughs> and you want to push that button and follow suit. <laughs> and we will take all the money you have <laughs> and translate it into scholarship assistance for kids around the world. We're international. In fact, we very recently joined forces with the Clinton Foundation in anticipation that as the eight of us age out, and we won't be around here for many more years, someone will continue to rob your pocketbooks and transform that money. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a course in economics. Velocity of cash. Have you had that course yet? Economics? Neither have I, but it's fascinating to think about. The velocity of money. <laughs> How $50 introduced to a village can resolve so many conflicts. And eventually that $50 moves on. It's done its work. Debts repaid, donations contributed, etc., etc. Money, by the way, is only one way of exchange in the universe. Those of you who grew up in America probably got hooked into that very early on, though, as money is being the only way. Um, very little bartering, sharing, etc. Those are topics for other sessions, but any more questions? There you are. Let's say if you did have a question, what would it be? Just in case. Oh, okay. She's protesting. She has a question, but she's unwilling to share it. No, no. In fact, none of us knew about what would happen. Everybody was shocked about what did happen. You know, the violence and the escalated violence. The intensity of that threw everybody for a loop because we had these vague notions that Arkansas was somehow considered upper South. <laughs> you know how you make these distinctions. We're not Mississippi. <laughs> I don't know what gave them that notion. But <laughs> they were shocked that People would really act out like that, true colors and all. But they just weren't paying attention, paying close attention, because if you, had I been paying close attention, I could have figured it out. That was one of the incentives for me to pay closer attention. So when I came to California, I was really on the alert. I could see stuff. And a lot of folk who had lived here before me hadn't seen the stuff I was seeing. You know, whoa, <laughs> really, oh yeah, that's true. How long after you attended Central High did you realize that you had started kind of a movement or made a difference? Well, I never really thought about it like that, even now. How I see what happened in Little Rock is in keeping with how the historical trail has evolved. And that is, through history, you will see usually small groups or individuals making concerted effort to force the system to change. Mm -hmm. The system has a tremendous ability to reinvigorate itself around, through, over, and beyond what you're doing. They can, sometimes co-opting works, you know, just draw you in. But in any case, this is like a blip. Oh, okay, got rid of it, okay, on we go. And so here we are, and we keep doing that. And unfortunately, even though that's the true path, 
a lot of people have bought into what I call the progress narrative. They say, simply because time has elapsed, things have gotten better. Over time, things get better. That's their notion. So wrong, so wrong. Time and space, both of those things are neutral constructs. You can act in space and in time, but unless you choose to act, this stuff doesn't happen. It doesn't happen automatically. And yet you could have uh, a man like Okay, I said I wasn't going there. Okay, I said I'm going to abide by my restrictions. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Okay. But there's so much to say. <laughs> so I think one thing that came up for a lot of people after we toured the museum this morning was um, a, a feeling of overwhelm. Um, maybe thinking, oh, things haven't changed and the repeat of cycle. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then kind of hovering on a spectrum of overwhelm to hope. And I'm wondering what keeps you, or if you have any thoughts on how do we stay towards that hopeful end, um, aside from everything you've already said that it speaks to Well, no, no, you're absolutely right. And there is a tremendous concept that comes out of the, the Jewish tradition. It's called tikkun olam. Some of you may be aware of that. Tikkun olam is a philosophy that says every human being in the universe is charged with the responsibility of working toward repair of the world. That's your job. By definition, you're being human. Your humanness gives you that job. Now, that's your assignment. Now the next part is information. The information is alert. You will never be able to complete that task. <laughs> okay? Ah! But even with that awareness, you don't have the right to opt out. Even though you're charged with the responsibility to repair the world, and even though you'll never finish that task, you cannot not work toward repair of the world. That's where I am. So it's not the same as Sisyphus pushing a rock, I hope. <laughs> but it's doing it even though you can't see the end. Hope always defined as having the ability to see beyond yourself into the next sphere, next generation, next life, whatever it is. The work you do will be fundamental for those who come after you. Think of it in those terms. Yeah, that way it makes sense. That way you can have the hope. And you can enjoy being here knowing that in some ways, you do have it better, in a sense, than other people who have lived, you know. Would you have been comfortable in Victorian America? <laughs> Whoa, okay. Uh, especially if you're a female. And it hasn't gotten all that better. Think about it. That's something we talk about, too, in terms of life as a female in these times, in this place. Oh, boggles the mind where we are. My own personal conclusion is, uh, in working with men especially, I think a lot of men don't like women. But then uh, they're forced to deal with them. <laughs> they're not happy about it. So, and it, at least all kinds of crazy stuff, all kinds. And I had a dilemma because I have two daughters. I mean, how do I give this message to them and yet not fill their minds with stuff that's gonna cause them to bend off all men who come into their lives? And I think I did a fairly credible job with it uh, because it pretty well balanced. So one, I had to take the risk, as you will have to take the risk, of teaching the truth to the kids you work with. I had to decide whether to teach my kids the truth. Unlike a lot of my peer group, my, a lot of my peer group members decided they weren't going to teach their kids about the awfulness of life in America. Now they said, we, as the parents, have the position have reached a position where we can afford comfortable home, private school, we can exclude them from places where they might get injured psychologically. And I heard that and I said, you know what? <laughs> You're setting them up. I'm gonna see those kids in therapy. And, and actually I did. I saw some of their kids in my practice simply because they were not equipped to handle the truth because their parents had fallen down on the job. They lied to them. They said, you can go out there and you can do and be because you're, you know, American. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but 
that's the fantasy a lot of people still use. My next door neighbor. He didn't know about my background for a long time, but then he found out and he said, you know what, I used to see that stuff on TV and it was so awful. When my kids were watching, I would change the channel, change it to Disney, okay. And I thought to myself, I didn't say it to him, but I thought, wow, you were content to raise a bunch of airheads. <laughs> and he was. So his kids, because of his socioeconomic position, have been able to have the best of education. They now occupy positions of power and authority in the world, but they know zip about the reality of life around them. Yeah. That may be too harsh an expression, but I've met these kids. <laughs> so I speak the truth that you will find too. This is not always the case. Some of these kids resist. So is it time to quit, Carly? Okay, I've been given the hook. I've been taken off stage. It's my turn to retreat. But in any case, I want to leave you with one last thing as teachers especially. Like I said, your job is a sacred trust. Every single child who ever encounters you are going to have a picture of you mentally embedded on his or her brain. Your question, what's that picture going to be? Okay, go forth and do well. I'll see you.